it's what we really like to see. Um, so again, please continue to share your introductions and hellos in the chat box. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to our uh, final Colorado webinar, or sorry, second to last Colorado webinar for the year, um, Small Town Big Impact and Exploring Safe Routes Projects in Rural Communities. Um, I'm Corey Johns from the Safe Routes Partnership. Um, those of you who've been on these webinars, you know, know us and know me. Again, if you are new to Safe Routes, we are a national organization um, whose mission is to advance safe walking and rolling to schools and to every, everyday destinations, improving the health and well-being of people of all income levels, abilities, disabilities, and building healthy communities um, for everyone. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and I'm uh, Corey Johnson, our Program and Engagement Manager here at the Partnership. I'm based in Washington, D.C., so that's where I'm joining you from. Um, a rainy day here, but that's okay. Um, rain is all good. And um, again, thank you all so much for sharing um, You know where you're joining us from um, in, in the chat box. Um, so I'll be starting off our presentation, then we have a great uh, presentation that's uh, following from um, an awesome team of Safe Routes practitioners and champions um, in Center Colorado, and I'll introduce them um, uh, a bit later. So we wanted to start off our session by doing a few um, polls to get a sense of you all's experience with uh, rural Safe Routes projects. So um, I'm going to go ahead and launch our first poll. And again, this is just for us to get a sense of um, you know, what you all have been working on, um, what have been some of your successes, what have been some of your challenges, and then how can we really be here to, um, you know, to help and support you, um, whether it's the partnership um, or this webinar series is um, sponsored by or funded by Colorado Department of Transportation. So anybody who's in the Colorado area thinking about how CDOT um, or other um, you know, agencies may be in your, your, in your area. Um, can really help you get rural safe routes projects um, up and running and implemented. So um, the first poll is we just want to know um, if you've been able to implement a rural safe routes project, um, and that could be infrastructure, non-infrastructure, or you haven't done one yet. So go ahead, I'll give people a few moments to um, add your responses, and then we'll go to the next question. You know, take about 20 more seconds. All right, now I'll close this out in 10 seconds. Um, all right, so it looks like um, we've had some people who've been able to do some non-infrastructure projects, um, a few infrastructure projects have also been implemented, um, but a lot of people who haven't done one yet. So um, that's totally fine. You know, we hope that, um, you know, by the end of this session, you'll have some new um, ideas or inspiration for, uh, for how you can successfully implement a, a rural safe routes project. Um, so our next question is... For those of you who um, haven't been able to implement a rural safe routes project, um, we're curious as to what's what's holding you back. What are those barriers? Is it the application process um, is really complicated? Um, matching funds, we hear that that's um, you know a, a, a major barrier for for rural communities, smaller communities. Is it lack of staff time, capacity? Is it data collection? Um, just unsure of how to get started. We know that a lot of these um, grant applications especially, you know, some that are, you know, the federal grants or state grants can just be a bit confusing and you don't know where to start. Um, how do you sustain it long term? So it's great if you do the project, but like who's going to maintain it when you actually, you know, get it, get it implemented? Um, you know, is it a partnership issue or if there's something else that's going on that's a challenge, um, please do share in the chat. And again, we'd love to hear from you all about what you're, you know, experiencing in your communities. So I will give this um, another 10 seconds. All right, so this one's a bit more evenly split. Um, so <laughs> all kinds of challenges. Um, a lot of people who are just not sure how to get started. Sustainability is always a you know a tough one. Um, you know, trying to engage your partners um, and even connecting with the right partners can be a can be a big barrier, and we understand that. And I'm going to take a peek in the chat to see if anybody else added anything else. Um, community buy-in. Yep, absolutely. So how do you get community members on board? Um, you know, what is what does that look like? Um, 
not having county sponsorship, you know, working with, um, you know, community members, um, city councils, town councils, um, you know, that can be a barrier as well. Um, okay, and then our last poll, um, and again, please feel free to continue to share in the chat box. Our last poll is, um, so what resources do you need to, to help you get started? Um, you know, how can how can we help you? Um, whether it's, you know, get people at the partnership, maybe people at your local, um, you know, agencies or organizations, um, you know, how can we be of assistance? We really like to hear from you all about, you know, what, what you need from us. Um, so take another 20 seconds, let us know. Again, share in the chat if there's something on here that's not listed. Another 10 seconds. All righty. So again, it seems like a mix, um, whether it's grant writing assistance, um, assistance with planning. There are a lot of grant projects that require you to have some sort of safe routes to school plan or transportation plan. So there are people who need help getting that plan together. Matching funds, always a big one. Um, community engagement, it seems like that's you know uh, one that's coming up a lot. Um, and I know that the Town of Center team, they're gonna talk a bit about some of what their community engagement has looked like in their presentation. Um, and again, please feel free to add those in the chat box as well. Um, thank you so much for sharing. So we 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 hear you, and um, we really want to you know get a sense of again what you all are experiencing, so that we know how to support you. Um, so please continue to you know share in the chat, um, share ideas, share resources. We're going to take this back and you know take a look at it um, too as we think about developing new webinars um, and 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 new resources. Um, so more to come from from us. Um, all right. So just a bit about. Um, about safe routes in rural communities, uh, why we wanted to have this be a focus of one of our webinars. It's something that um, a lot of you all have been asking for. Uh, people have been asking for ideas and support around implementing rural safe routes projects. We know here at the partnership that projects are possible, um, that funding is available, um, especially a lot of the new infrastructure funding. That's a great opportunity to get some things um, up and running in rural communities. And there are people who are you know, around who can help you navigate this process. Um, so again, while this is one of our Colorado webinars, um, we might talk about you know, Colorado agencies, um, you know, CDOT, um, you know, even in your community, there's, you know, your local transportation or planning department, um, a local organization, community champions. Um, these are people who, you know, can help support you um, through this process. And I think that what you'll learn, especially from the Town of Center's presentation, is that this really is all about teamwork and kind of an all hands on deck um, experience. So, you know, like you, you'll need those people and those partners um, to implement your projects. And we also know that this is an equity issue. So, you know, we often talk about, um, you know, the impact of, um, of uh, you know, um, inadequate infrastructure um, or safe routes programs um, in communities of color and rural communities. Um, and there are plenty of people of color who live in rural communities. So we know that um, communities with marked crosswalks um, tend to be, you know, higher income. Communities with sidewalks tend to be, um, tend to be higher income. You know, a lot of rural communities don't have the same infrastructure as other communities do. Um, you know, even things like bike lane requirements, um, we can see the, you know, the, um, the income disparities between communities that require bike lanes and those that don't, and even people who are killed by walking, um, killed while walking by income. So thinking about communities with lower incomes that have higher rates of people being killed, um, you know, while, while walking. Um, and so, you know, when we think about equity, again, we do want to make sure we keep our, you know, rural communities, smaller towns, um, you know, in, in mind as well when we're thinking about um, which communities to prioritize. Um, you know, but the good news is that there are so many benefits of doing um, rural safe routes projects. Um, you know, one being that community engagement piece. Um, you know, while it can definitely be a challenge, um, you know, community engagement can also be an opportunity. Um, so, you know, working with a, a, a smaller community, kind of having that, you know, close-knit, all hands on deck type of approach to this type of project, making it a bit more personal, hopefully, and less, uh, less bureaucratic. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for creativity and innovation, you know, knowing that infrastructure might be a struggle, um, you know, how can you kind of build in those, um, you know, creative or innovative ideas that might not be possible other places. Um, there are also a lot, of, a lot of opportunities for in education and encouragement activities. So again, knowing that infrastructure might be um, 
you know, uh, a major concern um, and, and, and a major barrier for safe walking and rolling. Um, there are also opportunities to do those education and encouragement activities. So if the infrastructure isn't there, there's still things that you can do, um, whether it's walk and roll on campus activities, um, you know, awareness campaigns. Um, there, there are ways to kind of, um, you know, work with, with what's available um, in your community. Um, and then, of course, there are still the infrastructure opportunities. Um, and we know that infrastructure is a key part of keeping people safe while walking and rolling, but also know that those projects are often, um, you know, super expensive and, and take longer to, um, you know, to, to implement. So uh, while infrastructure is you know, definitely important and, um, and, and there are opportunities to, to improve it, um, that education and encouragement piece um, is, is still there as well. Um, so just keep both of them in mind as you think about um, what projects you'll be uh, looking to implement. And of course, just a few resources that we've compiled on our end, um, the National Center for Rural Road Safety, if you don't know of them, um, I subscribe to their newsletter and they're always sending out all kinds of information about webinars and trainings and resources, um, and then they are great. Um, so I'll send the link to them, um, to their website and my follow-up email. Um, those of you who are in Colorado, um, you know, Colorado Department of Transportation or CDOT, um, they have information on their website as well. Um, the US DOT also has a site, um, a few pages on their site about um, grants for rural communities. So checking that out as well. Um, there's also Tribal Transportation Program Safety Fund, which I think is from, um, FHWA, um, and they're actually doing a grant writing webinar. It's tomorrow, um, but if you want to sign up for that um, or watch a recording of that, you can definitely do so. There's also the Safe Routes to School listserv. A lot of you are already on this already, um, but again, another great resource for people who are looking for like up to date on the ground information. So check out that. Um, and of course, other practitioners. So just ask us to collect to um, connect you. So, you know, sometimes um, just being able to like go right to somebody who's experienced something you have experienced, um, you know, is, is the most invaluable resource. So if you're looking for, you know, connections or opportunities to talk to other people who might be in similar situations to you, um, please feel free to let us know and we'd be happy to connect you with those people. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our awesome team um, at Town of Center, and they'll be presenting um, about their uh, Rural Safe Routes project, which includes um, infrastructure and non-infrastructure elements. So um, I'll just, just do a quick, a few quick introductions for you all. Um, so first we have um, Katrina Ruggles, who is a well, counselor, but also like many different things um, at Center, Co Center Co Consolidated Schools. Um, so you'll talk, you'll hear from Katrina about the many roles that she plays. Um, along with being a, you know, a wonderful Safe Routes champion um, who's been working on this project uh, for, for a long time. Um, we're also joined by um, Brisa Macias, who is the Parent Engagement Coordinator and works closely with, um, with Katrina, um, Brian Lujan, who's the Town Manager for Town of Center, and um, David Mahaffey is an on today, but he's the Public Works Director for the Town of Center and another really critical, um, you know, person who's been a part of the um, project that, um, that they've been able to uh, to get funded in Town of Center. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and pass things over to Katrina and she will um, introduce her team and get started with their presentation. So thanks for being here, Katrina. Thank you, welcome. Um, great to be here and to get to talk about something that we've worked on for a very long time and um, has a lot of meaning to us. So a, a little bit about um, who we are. I Again, I'm Katrina Ruggles. I am a counselor, but also um, I do grant coordination and really look at the whole child. So wraparound approach to um, the work that we do. And so that's a big reason why we got involved in this work is that we believe that it really met um, the social, emotional, and physical health needs of our students. And then again, as we think about an equity issue, we'll talk about this more, but really this became an equity issue in terms of our community and what our young people have access to. And I will let um, Brian introduce himself. In himself. <laughs> <clears throat> thank you, Katrina. And uh, thank you all. It's great to be here this morning. I see there's a lot of people from across the nation. So that's awesome to be interested in rural communities and, and you know, the Safe Routes to School initiative that we've uh, been doing here. Like Katrina says, it's been a long road and she's pretty much the champion that has started this prior to me getting on board. 
but I'm Brian Luan. I'm the town manager for the Town of Center. I have been the town manager since uh, late October of 2017 and quickly jumped into this project in the coalition early 2018. And we've just continued to strive uh, to, to get things going and moving along. Uh, and it's been a lot of persistence and, and getting a lot of people involved too that are the decision makers in this. And then I'll pass this on to Brisa. Hello everyone, I'm Brisa Macias and um, I'm the parent engagement coordinator for Sonar Center Schools, but I was also the SRTS uh, coordinator. I'm glad to be here with you all. Yeah, so prior to becoming our parent engagement coordinator, which was a really natural transition, um, Brisa was our first um, coordinator, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and she'll get to talk about that process. So um, we're I'm thankful that she's still here engaged in our project so that I could ask her to join us. <laughs> so a little bit about the town of Center. Um, we're located in Southern Colorado um, in what's known as the San Luis Valley, a high mountain uh, region. It's a flat area surrounded by mountains. Um, we're pretty uh, high elevation, I think what, 7,500 feet around there. Uh, we're a small town. Um, we can vary from 2,500 to, you know, about 2,800 people in our community. Um, about, um, of our student population, like 97% qualify for free and reduced lunch, meaning they are at a minimum 130% below the national poverty line. And so most of our young people and our families um, struggle with a lot of challenges that come with those so socioeconomic conditions. We also, um, we're about 90% um, Latinx, 2% um, uh, black and about 3% um, Native American. So most of um, our families and community have really experienced systemic marginalization and discrimination. And a lot of what we're dealing with now is because of a history of a lot of that, um, a lot of that. In addition, um, about, um, 25% of our student population qualify for McKinney-Vinto, which is um, home, uh, a homeless definition. And then also we have a highly migrant population, about 15% um, of our population. So lots of many, uh, lots of challenges in our community. Um, also a great place to be and live and work. <laughs> I've been here um, 24 five years, I think, <laughs> a long time. I've been here at the school and I love the work that I do and I love um, the, the community and we've really seen the needle move. And this has been a part of a bigger picture focused on, like I said, educating the whole child. So a little bit about our beginnings. Uh, we actually, I don't even know that I knew about Safe Routes to School at this time, but I was contacted, we were contacted by CEDA. In fact, I think it was my superintendent and he threw it over to me. Um, we were contacted by CDOT to say, hey, are you interested in a $5,000 grant around, um, you know, a planning grant to get started with Safe Routes to School? And they provided some technical assistance and um, helped us along the way. So at that point, I was appointed a appointed a coordinator. I was leading, I'm still doing this, but I was at the time leading our wellness committee. And our wellness committee was a group of people, um, administrators, teachers, staff, um, uh, other staff, parents, and community members that were focused on that idea of um, the whole child. And so uh, I was leading that. And so I kind of took over as a coordinator and we started maybe like what I would call a subcommittee of that larger committee focused on Safe Routes to School. And this was the beginnings of our coalition. And at that time we invited the town manager, also the police officer, um, and we started meeting. I remember we had our first meeting and we were talking about some of the challenges in the community. And one of the things that came up is that we had no crosswalks in front of the school. I remember the very next day, the town painted um, crosswalks. It was pretty funny, but right, uh, we were like, okay, that might be important. So um, it was just, it was a good partnership and everybody was interested in this idea of not only addressing, um, you know, some of the, the, town needs, but also our school needs. We really bought into the idea that um, 
when our students are healthier, they do better academically and walking and biking to school is a part of that. And real, and also having pride in our community helps promote pride within our school. Our student population, about 50% um, met obesity were um, overweight or obese. And so according to our nurse state, uh, data, and that that is a problem. And so something that we really are working to address and that fits, this work fits into that as well. So we um, we have a district wellness policy and we incorporated Safe Rouse to School into our wellness policy and included a requirement to promote a, um, Safe Rouse to School to have it a part of our wellness work. Um, we also um, started a, uh, teaching about walking and biking and the benefits and bike safety in our health classes. We started walking and biking to school days. We celebrated those. And then we had, um, we hosted some bike rodeos. And then at that time, we started doing the tallies and parent surveys. And so we've been doing them ever since. And that's been a great um, addition so that we know what is happening, um, who is walking, and what are some of the challenges and the reasons why people are not walking and biking. So um, at that time, I know we got a lot of support from CDOT. They literally came and went to some of our meetings and talked to us about the goals and taught us how to run a coalition and engage people and what Safe Routes to School was really about. We did have some challenges. You know, again, we didn't have crossing walks and we realized that was a problem. Um, consistency with our coalition members. So. Sometimes uh, really catching the vision is difficult for some people, particularly maybe school admin or um, uh, people that are pretty busy, you know, the police, uh, the police chief in town. <laughs> so um, having that consistency. We also found that literally our students did not own bikes. So um, that was a problem. So we would be talking, we would be wanting to do bike rodeos and nobody had a bike to come to those. Um, and then they really didn't have norms um, around using uh, bikes or safety equipment and nor did they own it. And getting access to that became a bit of a problem. We have several busy intersections and from our parent surveys, people found, felt this was a problem. Also parents cited speed of the traffic around the school. And um, one of the things we did immediately through our coalition for that was just literally just ask um, our police department to have um, an officer park in front of the school in the mornings. And that helped a bunch, <laughs> actually. Um, but that that was a problem. And then also time to coordinate the work. So, um, you know, in small communities, you you know that we get to wear a lot of hats and I wear multiple, multiple hats, even at that time. And so it became difficult to coordinate that work. And we'll, and so we will, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but also the cold, we are very, very cold. <laughs> and, um, and that became a challenge, especially in a high poverty community where a lot of our young people lack um, coats and um, boots and gloves, et cetera. So um, cold was often cited in our parent surveys, why they didn't allow students to walk and bike to school. So we took that information and we used it to write a um, full non-infrastructure grant and we're funded. And so, um, and that was a process too. I've been writing grants for the school for a long time, but to be honest, I've never been formally trained as a grant writer. I just sort of self-taught and um, had to just jump in and do it. So it was just a matter of, okay, what are they asking? And can I answer the question specifically to what they're asking? And again, um, relying on help from CDOT as well. So we realized that we needed someone to sort of take over and take the lead in this work. And we hired a part-time coordinator. And um, that's when we hired Brisa. And in a moment, I'm gonna let her talk um, about that process. But we also continued with our coalition and she led that work. Um, we made sure that, um, so we had a, um, at that time we created a district wellness plan and we incorporated um, so, uh, Safe Routes to School into that. And then um, all these other things that really Brisa led. So I'm gonna let her take over and start talking about those things. So 
Um, when I started uh, this position as an SRTS coordinator, I wasn't sure how this program was going to work. So since um, the SRTS coordinator and the town manager left their position, they take they took everything with them, like all the information we had. So um, we had to start all over again. So most of the parents, uh, they wouldn't let uh, the students walk to school because they were afraid of um, we did, there were any walk um, sidewalks uh, because we didn't have uh, crossing guards because of traffic. So then we had to start all over again. Um, we started with our uh, coalition meetings. Um, I invited like the uh, county commissioners, uh, center police chief, uh, center uh, town manager, and it was Brian. <laughs> and then um, center school staff or only crossing guard that we had. <laughs> and then we started to do uh, to develop the crossing guard program again. Um, I got trained. So I was able to train um, other parents. So it was really hard to get a uh, parents uh, get involved into and to do crossing guard or volunteers. So I started uh, with advertising uh, crossing guard. What was crossing guard? Why we wanted to do, why we wanted to have a crossing guard in our school. So I started uh, advertising uh, flyers on Facebook, Instagram, newsletter, um, so it was it was hard looking for volunteers. So um, I trained the first first parent. So it was it was really exciting for us having a crossing guard. So then from there, um, <clears throat> the boys uh, just went out to other parents. So here here I am uh, training other parents. We had like seven more parents join us for a crossing guard. And we were there like after, uh, in the mornings, really early in the mornings and after school. Um, <clears throat> we also, like Katrina said, we also partnered with the police officers. Having a police officer at the school zone was really good because um, um, at the beginning when the crossing guards were there, the traffic was crazy. They they didn't want to like they just pass by. They didn't know what to do. So it was pretty amazing seeing um, how they were doing different. And then um, we also developed a walking Wednesdays. So we make a big banner of walking willing Wednesdays. Uh, so we can like advertise so they can, they knew what was going on at the school. Uh, we had uh, more students walking and biking to school because we were giving them uh, PBI, PBIS points. And these are like little incentives that we give, uh, we give points to the students if they walk to school. And then we will we have like little stores with pencils, pens, notebooks, erasers. So they will be able to buy this stuff with their biking points. And then we also uh, create an after school bike and skateboard club. So we did one once a week these uh, programs. Uh, we did different lesson plans. Uh, like helpman safety, signal safety. And we also took students around town um, on trips to do, to have them put their skills um, into tests to see if they were learning something. <laughs> and then we did this, uh, we do this like during school year, but we also do it in, in the summer. Um, like Katrina said, we didn't have any bike the student didn't have any bikes so we start getting bikes like from jar sales and then uh like people start donating like more bikes or helmets or 
there will be like programs. We'll take the students to the programs and then we'll get a bike, new bikes or um, then we start doing like, um, we had like more of the community and parents involved into these programs. So it was it was really nice seeing everybody involved in 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 the programs. We also had like bike rodeos once a month. We have different activities. We had prizes, and and then we also had the National Walk to School Day in December, and then National Walk. We had the National Walk to School Day, and then we continue with some of the programs. Um, it has been a big asset to our district having these programs for our students. And now we can see like the difference since we when we started until now. So I think that's all I have for, for now. <laughs> awesome, Brisa. Everybody should have a Brisa. So you see <laughs> what having a coordinator did for us. And at this time, she was only part-time and was helping with other kinds of work. And um, so, but we also had some challenges, right? Safe, safety still remained a concern of parents. Uh, again, struggling to recruit crossing guards, particularly in a high poverty community. Um, we also, we started getting bikes donated and going to yard sales, but maintenance of those bikes and also storage. We had no place to store them. And then helmets um, became a problem. We also, at that point, were really, because safety was an issue, we, we felt like we need to apply for an infrastructure grant. But there was some pushback from the town of center at that time. And mostly, I will tell you, because... Um, of the match requirement. And so that's a huge, huge is issue. And so we wrote another um, non-infrastructure grant. We actually had the infrastructure grant pretty much ready to go. And kind of at the last minute, the, the town decided no. And again, it was really mostly that, that um, match issue. At this point, actually, be prior to this, um, Brian wasn't on our committee. It was another town manager. And we had a little bit of a turnover in town managers, but then we got Brian. So that's made a great difference about this point in time. So we got our um, next non-infrastructure grant and we were able to uh, make Brisa full-time. And then at that point, we continued with the coalition. I think we really, um, we also brought in our town. It's kind of weird because the road runs through it where we are um, split between two counties. And so we were at that point, we were able to bring on um, our county commissioners from both counties and get them to really engage. Um, we put that goal in our district health and wellness plan, um, continue to develop that crossing guard program. Um, Brisa mentioned the merit program really um, expanded that so that um, students could get um, what we call Viking bucks. Our school is the Vikings for walking and biking to school. We expanded the bike fleet, um, purchased um, a storage for them, continue with bike rodeos. Um, bike and uh, After school bike and skateboard club has been super popular. That skateboard club really came out of a desire from the students. They were like, miss, we want to be skateboarding to school. You know, so uh, however you might feel about that, they wanted that. And so we decided we better teach them a few safety things. And then we worked hard on that infrastructure grant for the next couple of years. It was, we met monthly with our coalition and it was just an ongoing question uh, or ongoing work um so then um but over those two years we still had some struggles again you can see some safety issues in these pictures um and then also staff turnover so at that point um brisa became my parent engagement coordinator so that's amazing it's awesome um, and she still helps recruit and um even do training she's helped me train every new person we've had <laughs> in the in the position but a, a little that also creates a challenge politics so you know there's town board elections there's school board elections 
for some reason in our community, and I think this is probably typical in a lot of small communities, there's a little bit of um, challenge between the politics of the town and the politics of the school. And so who's responsible for what, who should pay for what, who's, who should lead this? Um, so that became a bit of a problem. And then in kind was just a super challenge. How are we going to figure this out? Because match um, in a, a in a high poverty community is a huge issue. Also, we were struggling with right away easements and how to get those. And then, like I said, we're two counties. So one county is like, is this your responsibility? Is our responsibility? We wanted to build a sidewalk that was going to cross over the the you know the two counties and. People were fighting about whose whose responsibility that was, and so you can see in these pictures, um, this was a huge issue. This is a um, highway that runs through our town that actually splits the two counties, and we have truck traffic, we have farm traffic. It um, in the mornings because of the sun, it's pretty dangerous, and we have a huge low income migrant. Um, uh, housing complex on the other side that students walk from and so it became an issue how we were kind of trying to figure that out so um in 2020 we were able to um we wrote the grant again we got both this time um we were really excited because this was like four years in the making we got an infrastructure grant and we also got the non-infrastructure grant so just a quick bit and then i'm going to let brian talk about the infrastructure grant but we were able to um, get a full-time coordinator. We conti uh, were continue with that, continue with our coalition, um, continuing to do the crossing guard program. We also addressed a few other things like um, the cold and we, we got coats literally for our crossing guards because a lot of our crossing guards literally can, you know, can't afford those kinds of things. Um, continue to make sure we um, had a working bike fleet and um, bike rodeos and continue with our clubs. So Brian, infrastructure. Thank you very much, Katrina and Brisa. Yeah, so um, when I got on board, like they were mentioning, I think it's important to say the, the political atmosphere and, and as Katrina hit on as far as who was gonna be responsible for what, and then also the turnover uh, at this position and at the schools, uh, at, at the school positions and just uh, keeping people on board, uh, which is a true testament to one of the things when I was asked and was told about this coalition that was on, I quickly you know, started to, to get engaged and was very impressed on how they've pulled county commissioners from both counties to the table. Uh, they pulled other people, duty experts, as far as, you know, when it comes to streets and how to get right-of-ways. And if you're going to put in sidewalks, you have to do uh, certain things to make sure there's no um, uh, squirrels that are going extinct or any any certain patterns on all this stuff when it came to uh, breaking ground on a lot of the stuff. And then uh, a lot of it was, you know, some of the right-of-ways and, and whose right-of-way was it? Was it Sawatch counties? Was it uh, Rio Grande counties? Was it the property owner counties? So there was a lot of things that we had to start looking at. So uh, when we started doing the infrastructure grant, you know, um, one of the things when when I brought it to my current board at the time when I got there, um, there was a big thing like, well, what's the school's responsibility? How are we going to do this? And how much is this match going to be when you're looking at wanting to put sidewalks? Um, and unfortunately, the first time around, my board wasn't on board with it. And um, Quickly, I mean, we're taught as town managers is don't get in, don't get vested in the outcome of a certain project. It's really just being persistent in in how you continue to go on it. So I mentioned the county commissioners being put on board, and that's why I was really impressed about the coalition putting them on because when you have county commissioner on board and they are really looking and they are supporting the project, it's really hard for then your town board members to want to go against that. So that's kind of how I leveraged it the next time around. And we got the, the non uh, or the infrastructure grant approved, which is $750,000 is what the grant is. And so we quickly got to work on 
where are we going to put these sidewalks? It's also important to know that we really didn't have much sidewalks in the town. So, you know, we were we were very excited about it. And what really helped in, in going after this grant was COVID because COVID hit. So then CDOT said, we are waiving the match on this grant. And uh, it was a quick no brainer for us that we are now, you know, getting this money. We don't have to match anything and we're gonna uh, go after some sidewalks. So the picture that you see here is really what we were looking at wanting to do. And it's really from our main street, it's called Worst Street up to Broadway, which, which is the school. So if you're looking at that big picture, just um, I guess it would be to your left as you're looking at the screen, of where all the pink is, that's that's the school. So that's walking to the school from our main business district street. And the project would consist of sidewalks, signage, crosswalks, striping, and ADA, um, and the public right-of-way accessibility guidelines. So all that was gonna come into play. Um, but then we quickly found out, uh, I think uh, Karen from Montana had mentioned it was an easy process before, now it's a little bit more complex and that there's strings attached to it. So we found that there was some CDOT red tape. So the 750,000, there was some red tape with that. So we didn't really have that amount of money to go towards sidewalks. Next slide, please. Katrina, can I get the next slide, please? Yeah, so then we looked at um, uh, this part here is once we realized, okay, well, we're not going to have that much money uh, in a sense because of, you know, certain aspects that CDOT requires you to do. There's some engineering involved. There are some flaggers that are involved to stop traffic while you're doing the projects. And so the sidewalks would consist from our Worth Street, which is our main business district to Broadway. And we were looking at uh, originally a sidewalk from Tia Nueva housing uh, district um, or housing area across Highway 112, which is that pink line that goes down from the school to the bottom of your screen there. And that was the intersection that Katrina was talking about where it, it's real heavy traffic. It runs east to west. So in the morning, you know, people driving into town, the sun's in their eyes. And then in the evening, people driving out of town, the sun's in their eyes. So it was a real safety issue going on there. And that's where there was a lot of the right of way concerns and who owns what and how are we going to do this and can we get permissions on it. So we looked at doing uh, sidewalks on 5th, 6th and 4th Street as far as that infrastructure. We felt like we can we can do this in two parts of a of a infrastructure grant. We would take care of this side of the town as you get to the business district to the school, and then the next time we would go from the business district to uh, the rest of the town, uh, so that way they can make it up through there. Next slide, please. So this is just more of a broader above picture of that intersection that we're talking about where you have potato trucks, tractor trailers, all this because of the industry and the industrial areas that we have with our potato warehouses and our farming warehouses. Um, so the, the biggest thing that was concerned with it, it was how do you get it across and how do you, how do you make it safe? And it's still somewhat a little unsafe in a sense where in the mornings we've had a police officer there with the lights on as they're crossing that particular side or a crossing walk that you see in the picture. Um, so another project that the infrastructure grant is gonna do is gonna consist of a rapid rectangular flashing beacon, you know, uh, with the crosswalk uh, with appropriate signage that people will know to go across 112. And originally I, I had a request from CDOT to try and get rumble strips, uh, which are the grooves that are cut into the pavement uh, prior to this intersection. It just kind of wakes people up and slows them down. But again, there's red tape involved with CDOT unless there's high accidents that are involved at this intersection, uh, or if there's that data that is uh, uh, put into play with this intersection. Those are the things you can't just put certain things there. 
Uh, and there were many ideas to come across this thing. We thought about a, a light, which wouldn't go. We, you know, there was many ideas that the coalition prior to me getting on board, you know, really paved the way of a lot of things. So we're still working the sidewalk, as I mentioned, from this particular intersection down to that housing unit where we have our migrant housing uh, and a lot of students that walk to school from this area. Next slide, please. Yeah, so we found, uh, once we got done, we found that, uh, and we had CDOT come down and, and we had some people come and we walked this site. We found that there really wasn't a need for the curb and gutters because we don't have a drainage system. So it was gonna take a little off the cost of, of, of the monies that we were gonna use to put in this sidewalk infrastructure. So now we're looking at actually 6th Street, 5th Street, 4th Street, and some a third, as long as the budget is going to allow with it. So the more that we can get involved on it, the better that it's gonna be. And, and so as long as we continue to plan this appropriately and we get the, the right people as far as when once you go out for requests for proposals and, and, and these contractors put in their bids, you know, we, uh, oh, and that's another thing. It's just not the lowest bidder. It's actually qualified work that CDOT requires you to do. So, you know, we can get a local guy who can do it for, you know, a, a lower amount, but it's all about qualifications and how many times have you done this? So there is the more complex, as, as Karen mentioned from Montana, that, that is involved with a lot of the stuff, but it's perseverance and, and keeping persistent and, and keeping that coalition alive and, and continue to move with it is what really has is, is made this happen. And, and the town board is now on board with it because they understand the sidewalks, they're getting more engaged. They can't wait to pave the, or to put sidewalks in, in the rest of the town leading up to the school. So it's been a huge success and, and the community engagement is just a testament to the coalition that, that Katrina and her staff have put together. Next. Yeah, and again, the, the challenges are the same. You know, the staff turnover at my position prior to me getting here, and then just having a uh, uh, turnover with police chiefs, uh, police officers involved, or just uh, uh, some of our staff who were engaging in and attending these meetings. The right of way easements are, are hard. We own, as far as the town own, a lot of the majority of the right of way easements from the center of our streets within the town. So those are relatively easy. But then you get in a fight with somebody who thinks that it may be their easement because their property is right there. So then you're fighting with property owners because it might take up some of their parking or a sidewalk is going to impede them coming to their business or, you know, uh, situations like that. So it's very sensitive. And you have to, you know, you have to take take that with a grain of salt and really work on how how you communicate with these folks because you know you catch more flies with honey than you do with vinegar in, in most cases. So uh, again, the CDOT red tape is is one of the biggest things where we thought we had this huge lump sum, but then we quickly realized, you know, there are other things that this money. Um, has to go to to meet their guidelines uh, when applying for this stuff from the Colorado Department of, of Transportation. Yeah, and Brian, I was just going to mention too, I think one of the things there is uh, CDOT was very helpful in helping us understand that. And so we had to, um, you know, th they helped us build, we built a budget, got all these things, and they said, they looked at it and like, wait, let's go through it. So they revised the budget, et cetera, and helped us understand a little bit more about that. We have a question, Brian, about what height and width of sidewalks are we planning? Uh, we're doing uh, three inches thick and four feet wide, I believe is what the standard norm is right now. Um, and unfortunately, my public work director is dealing with the water leak. That's why he is unable to be on this particular call. He would have those uh, um, those detailed ones, which I can definitely get to uh, the staff here and get those those questions answers that I can. But I'm pretty sure we're going uh, four feet wide, three inches thick. So yeah, and then of course, like we said, there was some fight about like, why are you putting sidewalks here and not other places? So we need more sidewalks. So we're hoping to do this in phases. 
Um, I will say that one of the things I forgot to mention, I, I wrote both the non and the, and the infrastructure grants. I wrote the non infrastructure one for the on behalf of the school, the infrastructure on behalf of the town. Um, but uh, uh, there was a wave of the match that because of COVID and everything. So although COVID-19 was a challenge, it did offer that opportunity. So it really opened things up and really took away that barrier for us. So some overall successes, um, I think having that coordinator has really been critical. Having an amazing person really lead this work like Brisa, um, the, our current coordinator has COVID <laughs> literally today, so she's not with us, but we have a new coordinator and she actually works closely with Brisa, who is our parent engagement coordinator, because our school district has a high um, emphasis on that family school community partnership. And this is a way to get people involved in a lower um, kind of risk way in terms of, you know, family engagement and education anyway. Um, again, uh, developing that crossing guard program, we've had some people that have been, this guy in particular in this picture, he's been a crossing guard for a very long time and actually was on our school board when we first recruited him. Uh, also, um, our bike and walking safety education and those clubs, they're super popular. We have, I mean, tons of kids doing them. And our, more kids are walking or biking, um, I will say in particular, because they didn't even have bikes before. And so that's been really exciting. That again, the town collaboration has been awesome. Uh, I think it's even mended some of those um, difficulties of politics that had happened before and moving forward on all kinds of projects, not just this one anymore. Um, other kinds of great things that we're working together on. County collaboration has been super important, important and they helped us actually um, get a sidewalk and bridge in one of those areas that I showed you before. So this was the original picture. Those pictures on the top are the original pictures. You can see where we had kids kind of just walking in the street and there's truck traffic. It's all, it's really a dangerous spot there and no sidewalks too. We now have a bridge, which is just on the side over here and then a sidewalk all the way across that bridge. And so our town, our county actually um, provided the funding to help us do that. And so that's been a big success and um, super excited about that. Now, um, this current grant is gonna help us put that light right here. You see where the truck is, uh, cause that's where the bridge is. Whoops, I am in a school, sorry, bells are ringing. But so that's been um, a super, um, big success for us. So um, this is our contact information. Uh, Brian is uh, with the town of center. I'm here at the school. I didn't include Brisa because she's not doing that role right now. But if you do want to talk to Brisa, she will talk to you and I will, um, I can get you her information. And at this point, we're opening it up to questions. I've tried to answer a few uh, that you've put out there for me and I think I've missed some, but. <laughs> Thanks yeah. so much, everyone. Um, yeah, Brian and Katrina and, and Brisa, you all are um, awesome and, and so inspiring. Um, everything from your, you know, coalition work to the, you know, to the engagement, just your persistence for, you know, getting this done over, you know, years, right? Like this is a year long, you know, multi-year um, um, effort. So thank you all so much for, you know, sharing, um, you know, sharing your experience um, and, and expertise. Um, so we do have some questions that came through the uh, Q&A box, and I can run through some of them. Um, and if there are people who, like, we haven't answered your questions, um, we'll make sure that we can get those answers to you in our follow-up email. Um, so we have a question about um, uh, incentives for crossing guards, if they were paid or were they offered other, um, other incentives. So we did not pay our crossing guards. That has come up many times, just to be honest. Um, but what we did do, and Brisa worked really hard to do this, we got uh, donations from like our local grocery store for gift cards. Um, we have a, a pool that's about 10 or 15 miles away, but it's a pretty cool pool, a swimming pool. We got passes to there, uh, uh, restaurants, um, other kinds of department store uh, gift cards. And so what we started doing is every month, um, we would give out those um, gift cards to people who volunteered so much during the month. 
So that's how we've done it so far. I think ideally I would like to be able to pay our crossing guards also given the poverty in our community, just to be honest, but that mostly worked. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, no, no, those are great ideas thinking about, yeah, you know, that, that creativity and, you know, kind of thinking about different ways to, to compensate people. So thanks for that. Um, do you have any data on how many kids are walking or biking regularly now compared to like, you know, seven or eight years ago when you, when you started? Yes. Yeah, so, um, we've been doing the tally and, uh, I, I will tell you that, um, I wish I had it off the top of my head because I don't, I'm like, well, why didn't I look that up? But at any rate, um, we do definitely have more kids walking and biking. I will say that initially we went up a lot at first, then COVID hit. And obviously like school wasn't even in session for a little while. And I have to say when we came back to school with COVID, I felt like we were starting over a little bit. Like we dropped again um, and numbers dropped. Um, so uh, we are definitely higher, but it's been a roller coaster. It hasn't been like a straight path. So Yeah, I'm sure there are lots of communities who are in very similar positions. So we yeah, all understand what that's like. Um, were there any conversations around cost analysis from walking versus busing? Um, you know, thinking about there are a lot of communities that have school bus shortages, um, but there are a lot of students who also need to be bused to school because they live so far away. So I'm just curious if there are any conversations around cost analysis. Well, that would be great. We haven't done an actual cost analysis. I'm like, I should do that. But we have definitely had the conversations about that because we are in the same boat. We cannot get bus drivers. And so I think it's that dual benefit. We've talked about the physical wellness, also just the idea of walking and activating the brain before school. Um, so we've talked about that with our administrators and our school boards, but also the idea of reducing cost um, by having... Um, fewer buses. I think previously when, you know, in a small community, um, we are the primary employer. So there is a little bit of that push pull, like, are we taking jobs away or, you know, having a uh, cost savings? I think initially when it was like, there were enough bus drivers and we were okay, that was a little bit of an issue. Now we can't fill bus drivers positions. So I think, unfortunately that might work in our favor, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thanks. And um, I think this might be our final question. Have you been able to do any driver education? I know you've mentioned like, you know, the the trucks that are rolling through or just a lot of traffic, um, you know, that's that's coming through the town. So have you done anything with driver education? No, good, good, off, good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this whole presentation has been just a bunch of sharing of different ideas and, you know, sparking our imagination. So... <laughs> Okay. Um, if anybody else has any other, you know, final questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat box. And if we didn't get a chance to answer anything, we will definitely make sure we can answer it afterwards. Yeah. Um, I, will, you know, yeah, I go just ahead. want to mention this last thing here, though. Yeah. We do have a Promotora model in our community, actually. And we have Promotoras that help us promote the program. So currently we pay them a stipend and we do home visits, we do phone calls, uh, we do booths and tables. And we have a promotora at each school level um, who then uh, like they they do a variety of things, but also for our safe routes to school program. So they help us not just uh, recruit crossing guards, but promote the idea of walking and biking to school. So um, we do also use that model. Awesome. Yeah, there, there was also another question and it seemed to disappear and I'm not sure if you answered it, but um, it was about. Where did you get the funding for Brisa's position? Oh yeah, I think I answered it, but that was from the non-infrastructure grant. That was through CDOT. Correct. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So people had questions about where the grant funding was coming from. Um, Town of Centers received a lot of support from CDOT, um, you know, both with the, you know, grant funding and then also just support around, you know, how do you do this? <laughs> how do you apply? What can you do? What can't you do? So we wanna shout out our, uh, our, our CDOT partners as well. 
Yes. Um, well, thank you all so much. Um, again, a town of center team, um, so inspiring, so helpful. Thank you all so much for you know sharing your your time and energy and expertise um, and experience. We really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, for our participants, we will be sharing a recording of this webinar um, and the slides. If you missed anything, um, those will you know be coming out tomorrow. And if you want to follow up with uh, with Brian or Katrina or Risa, um, their information will be there as well. Um, and we will. We'll um, have our final Colorado Safe Routes to School webinar on December 14th, which we'll do. Um, we'll talk about our year of community engagement and share some great highlights. And then we'll be back in January with a whole new webinar series. So more to come. Um, we're, we're glad that you all are here um, and, and with us. And thanks for joining us today. And uh, we will see you all next time. So thanks so much. And thank you to Brian, um, Brisa, and Katrina. Keep us posted on how things are going, too. We're excited to see how everything unfolds um, in, in Center. So thank you all so much.